Hello and welcome to the debate. I'm your host Sana Makbul with you at PTV World. In today's show, we will be talking about two very important stories. The first story is something that we also discussed last week in our show with reference to the recent spike in terrorist attacks in Pakistan, in which evidence has also been found with links of handlers in Afghanistan and India. We have always known that Indian soil and Afghanistan soil has been used against Pakistani territory, but this time around, um, after uh, the recent spike in terrorist attacks um, and in the last one, on Sunday in which five Pakistani soldiers have also embraced martyrdom in the exchange of fire. Uh, we have seen that Pakistan government has publicly also uh, talked about Afghanistan soil uh, being used against Pakistan and for terrorist activities uh, since the Taliban regime uh, took over control in Afghanistan. Uh, this has been the first time that this has been publicly stated as well. Of course, uh, this is um, in response to what has been going on for a while now with, with the recent spike in terrorist attacks and also um, despite uh, reassurances uh, from uh, the Afghanistan side we see that the soil is still being used against Pakistani territory and there's so much that needs to be done in that regard we'll talk about all of these issues in further detail and see what really can be done what does the Taliban regime need to do about this how does Pakistan respond to these terrorist attacks and how does it um, get that assurance from the government uh, in Afghanistan uh, that its soil will not be used against Pakistani territory we will also be taking a look at the situation with regard to the crisis in Ukraine. We've, we've seen um, that a Cold War-like era is being developed uh, between uh, the Western Front and the NATO alliance and of course Russian forces as well. Um, in a recent summit uh, between China's Xi Jinping and Russia's Vladimir Putin, uh, who is on a visit to China to attend the Winter Olympics in Beijing, uh, a statement has come out where both the countries have categorically um, asked NATO to abandon um, its, its approaches and its eastward expansion and called for security assurances for Russia, something that Russia has been calling for in the past as well. They've also uh, re-emphasized um, their own relations as well. Um, they've talked about enhanced strategic and trade relations between Russia and China. Um, and of course, uh, this uh, particular movement towards developing a closer tie uh, between Russia and China is in response uh, to both the countries uh, sharing their reservations against the US and the EU as well. And we'll see how that is going to impact international politics at large um, and how is it going to also affect the crisis in Ukraine and moving forward the kind of expectations uh, that Russia has from NATO and vice versa. Uh, for this um, and other issues related to both of these stories, as always, I've been joined in the studio by Farouk Batafi and Raja Faisal uh, with me in this show uh, in the debate. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for being with me today. And of course, uh, we'll be also joined by our experts online as well uh, in both of our segments. And as soon as you join in, I'm going to introduce them. We've been joined by our first guest um, in the segment with reference to the, the, the spike in terrorist attacks and, of course, Afghanistan soil. We've been joined by Brigadier Retired Mr. Salim Kamarbat, who's a senior analyst. Thank you very much, sir, for being with us on the debate. Just last week in the debate, we were discussing how Pakistan uh, needs to respond to the terrorist attacks in which we know uh, that there are links um, of these terrorists and their handlers in Afghanistan and in India as well and what needs to be done with regards to uh, getting that reassurance that we need from the Taliban regime and action uh, for them to be able to do something about these terrorist attacks. Of course, Afghanistan soil um, has been used uh, against Pakistan in the past as well, continues to do so. But what can Pakistan do in terms of getting that reassurance from the Taliban regime in power in Afghanistan? This has been asked for before as well but can we really expect something from the Taliban regime that they can actually do in terms of uh, providing that sort of reassurance to Pakistan? Brigitte Salim. I'm sorry, I couldn't hear your question clearly. Can you ask please again? Yes sir. Brigitte Salim, could you please respond to that? Yeah. Uh, I said uh, kindly repeat your question. I couldn't hear it. All right. My, my question is with reference to, of course, Pakistan's um, efforts in terms of getting a reassurance from the Taliban regime uh, in Afghanistan that its soil uh, will not be used against Pakistan. Um, and despite those efforts, we know that it has been and continues to do so. And re just recently, we've seen a spike in terrorist attacks in Pakistan as well with links in Afghanistan. Uh, what can Pakistan do um, in terms of getting that reassurance uh, from the Taliban regime in Afghanistan? This call has been made before as well. Uh, but what really can be done in terms of an action that can be taken perhaps by the Taliban regime to provide a sort of security guarantee to Pakistan? 
Right. Uh, my uh, answer would be uh, from two perspectives. One is purely to do with the capacity of the interim uh, Taliban government in mm -hmm. Afghanistan who have given assurance by words of mouth. But uh, that has not been uh, adequately proved by actions. So it may have something to do with their capacity and their, their authority and their writ, which it may, may not be as established in Afghanistan, especially along uh, the complete length of the border with Pakistan. That is one. Second is the spoilers. They are still prevailing there. Uh, the former uh, uh, regime, the NDS, that was working hand in glove with Indian RAW and other hostile agencies, that continued to uh, uh, unleash the hybrid war in Pakistan, which Pakistan has been subjected to in the last 22 years. So that yeah. continues. Uh, another angle to look at this is that uh, why this is happening now. The timing is very important. Uh, when pa Pakistan Prime Minister was visiting China. So suddenly we saw a spike in the terrorist activities uh, in Balochistan. So maybe it was something to uh, message to China that Pakistan was not secure and undermine China-Pakistan Economic Corridor Initiative. That could be one. Other right. could be to spoil the relation between Taliban regime and Pakistan government, uh, creating such an impression that Taliban are perhaps uh, keeping, uh, they are looking the other way. The third could be incidents are happening uh, along Pakistan-Iran border. And this could be yet another effort by shifting the base of operation because of the squeeze spaces in Afghanistan to, uh, to Iran side. And then, then uh, trying to make sure that the relation between Iran and Pakistan also gets spoiled. So uh, this tantamount to killing too many birds with one stone, you know, on the part of the uh, uh, hostile uh, agencies. Uh, of uh, India, uh, uh, former agency of uh, right. uh, Brigadier, but uh, no, since you're talking about uh, the possibility of ungoverned spaces within Afghanistan, that uh, because of that vacuum, uh, the enemy might be able to actually exploit this situation. Similarly, when it comes to Balochistan, once again, you are referring to the spike being connected to the other side of the border. Uh, 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 with due respect, I want to understand everything in terms of numbers. Uh, when we say Afghan Taliban don't have the capacity to govern the entirety of Afghanistan, I want you to tell us how many Afghan Taliban there are and do they really not have that kind of space because there right. seems to be a lot of buildup on the other side of the border, maybe uh, Iran or Afghanistan, that might be used for such a spike. And I understand that regardless of what happens in, uh, you know, Iran, Iran has a managed border and it has a managed uh, spaces also. So what exactly is going on? Just help us understand in terms of numbers. And I'd just like to add to that as well. Um, with reference to not only just territory, does the Taliban actually have the capacity in terms of their competency and capability as well? Yeah. And numbers, of course. How many are there? Uh, is the question to me, uh, for a Yes, yeah. yes, but sir. Uh, yes, please. All right. Farouk, you are still acting as an anchor instead of uh, the lady out there. Uh, I would love to answer your question anyway. Uh, as regards the number, if you are asking me how many Taliban uh, forces are there, uh, the American estimate, we knew that they were saying there were 75,000 to 100,000. But uh, as they come to govern, Surely their numbers uh, must have been increased by incorporating the forces, the law forces which were available there. But uh, as you know, they don't have even money to pay salaries to the policemen and the, and, and the uh, army. So that is uh, one impediment in terms of when I talk about the capacity, it is their capacity not to even pay the salaries to the teacher or to talk of the uh, armed forces per, uh, per, personnel. Uh, uh, but sorry to cut you, sir, but how were they paying salaries to their foot soldiers while they had not taken over? They, that, is the, that was the time when uh, uh, Ashraf Ghani was in government. Uh, before that happened, Karazi was there, and who was funding the government was the Americans. And when huh. they left, they were funding right. They even stuck up money has not been unfrozen, and that is why uh, uh, we are hearing from the international leaders who are uh, requesting America to unfreeze uh, the Afghan money stuck up into the international banks. So this is something to do with, uh, to do with that. But I, I think we should rather be discussing uh, what are the reasons 
for this uh, spike of uh, sabotage activities in Pakistan? What are the motives? Who are doing it? And uh, how are they doing it? What could we do about it? Rather than uh, getting embroiled into what is happening in the Taliban setup, uh, yeah. we got to, I think, discuss more regarding our own self rather than discussing about the Taliban. Bagheri, Bagheri, but, uh, you know, uh, if we talk about, obviously, the capacity of uh, the Taliban regime, and if we talk about that right now, of course, they are facing a humanitarian crisis in their own country as well. So that could affect their capacity to handle uh, the, uh, obviously, uh, the terrorists, because we need to understand that uh, ISIS Khorasan is a huge threat for Taliban as well, and we know that they have a history of fighting against the ISIS Khorasan in past as well. And right now, if we talk about the other uh, terrorist groups as TTP, you know, uh, IMU or uh, uh, ETIM, all of these, they associate themselves to some extent with the ISIS Khorasan. So it's a common threat for Taliban as well as the regional uh, countries as well, China, Pakistan, you know, all of the Central Asian republics as well, I must say. So don't you think, sir, that this is the right time to talk with Taliban, that if they have capacity issues, then that can be met by, you know, a joint or, uh, you know, a multilateral uh, uh, contribution uh, towards, you know, countering the terrorism within uh, uh, Afghanistan so that the region can be made safe as well as, well as Taliban uh, regime can be made safe as well in Afghanistan, sir? You're right. I think uh, you, uh, you have made in your opinion, uh, uh, and uh, that is what I think Pakistan is already doing. Uh, our NSA visit to Afghanistan um, a few days ago, all these details uh, must have been discussed. Uh, but uh, uh, capacity building of another country is not all that easy and simple as we tend to uh, assume. Uh, I'm sure uh, Taliban are getting the maximum diplomatic and all sorts of support from Pakistan, and uh, we all know the details. And these, uh, these things are, are discussed, but I think when you are confronted with proxies launched by bigger countries, far bigger, with far bigger objectives, uh, then even for pa a country like Pakistan, it is not easy to deal with, with that. Ultimately, what we are seeing now is the battlefield by the hybrid war, further hybrid warfare, which is actually meant for whole of uh, Qasar region, Central Asia and South Asia. It seems to be now presently shifted to Balochistan and KPK. So that is, uh, that is a big point for us, that ultimately who is being targeted and what is being targeted and by whom. So this is what is important for us. Of course, capacity building of Taliban, we will do whatever we can do. China would do whatever China has to do, because China is the biggest stakeholder in Afghanistan, and they have a larger interest, including Russia and even Central Asian Republic. They have larger stakes for stability and peace in Afghanistan. Uh, Pakistan is, of course, number one uh, badly impacted country. So I agree right. with you um, that and Brigadier Saab, earlier... Earlier, of course, you were talking about how we need to perhaps focus more um, on the issue that we're facing in terms of the recent spike in terrorist attacks within Pakistan than on the Taliban regime. Um, but of course, these issues are also very intrinsically related to each other as well. And would it be possible for us to actually isolate the two and deal with the situation at home with the TTP or other terrorist attacks within the country um, without our reference to the Taliban regime or Afghanistan soil? Because of course, those links exist and they're there. Um, can we actually come to a solution or a way forward in which we do not involve the Taliban regime and we proceed towards um, uh, dealing with the terrorist groups within our own territory in a way that does not involve the Afghanistan government? Of course, uh, I, I never said that we must not involve Taliban. We must involve Taliban uh, government. We must help them to help us, actually, uh, because we knew it that when Americans were here, uh, you remember 2011, uh, 2014, when uh, a lot of terrorist activities happened in Pakistan. American uh, ZU Blackwater, uh, supported by CIA, did a lot of things in 2011, and that saw Pakistan-America relation uh, go to the, the deepest point, you know, um, in bilateral. 2014 APS uh, incident, you remember. Uh, but having said that, let's not forget that we are not directed, uh, the hybrid war we are facing is from three directors. One is from the east, from India directly. Second is from our southern border with Iran. Uh, remember Gulbashin Yadav, 
and his network operating from Chabahar and uh, it was spread all over Balochistan. And then uh, Balochistan uh, border uh, with Afghanistan and KPK border with Afghanistan. So in KPK, TTP is uh, uh, playing the main role. In Balochistan, the Balochistan uh, uh, terrorist outfits like BLA in the lead and supported by other, uh, we speculate that the merger have taken place by the handlers as we intercepted recently at Pengur and Nushki, that all those Baloch terrorists who were uh, independently acting under different names and manners are now all united. Uh, they are targeting Pakistan armed forces, which are basically making sure that the CPAC security is taken care of. So when uh, only the focus comes on the center of gravity, that is Pakistan armed forces who are making sure that the peace and stability prevails in all over Pakistan, and especially in KPK and uh, Balochistan, where uh, the relative peace was won on a very, very high price. So yeah. uh, we got to focus now. Faisal, I yeah, wanted to actually talk to you as well because yeah. earlier you were yeah. making a comment about ISIS and TTP being aligned and I just wanted to uh, actually uh, identify certain nuances that are actually uh, somehow swept under the carpet. Uh, we know that ISIS is a mortal enemy of the Afghan Taliban. Mm. Uh, we know that they have been fighting but the, here's the problem. Both TTP and ISIS uh, Khorasan are caliphate mo uh, movements, right? Mm. They are militant caliphate movements and they have both the independent or different c candidates for caliphate. caliphate. Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, when you talk about ISIS, uh, K, they have their own individuals uh, sitting somewhere outside the region. Mm. Mm. But when you talk about TTP, they don't actually endorse their candidate. Mm. They have the same candidate as TTA. Mm. And that becomes a problem for me because at this moment we are talking about, uh, talking about Afghan soil mm -hmm. being used against Pakistan. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, so the, uh, shouldn't we be actually asking about, exactly. uh, you know, fencing more mm. and ensuring whatever happens within my borders, I don't care what happens from outside, I'm just going to clear out all mm. the terrorists no matter what. Yes, we should do that. And uh, Farooq, according to my sources, obviously defense sources, uh, I think we need to categorize uh, between uh, uh, within TTP as well. There are few factions who uh, are uh, obviously sitting with ISIS Khurasan right now, right. and there are the still bad, uh, bad Taliban and the good Taliban. Uh, but how? How are you going to distinguish that? Is there a well? That is for it? that is entirely up to Taliban because they are the ones who are there, and they uh, categorize. They need to categorize them, and they need to obviously give their lists and everything, and they themselves need to fight against them as well because they must know that just because of uh, you know uh, these TTP they are uh, TTP is uh, you know source of uh, it seems uh, very arbitrary you know, yeah it, 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 it is right. becoming a source of you know conflict between Pakistan and Taliban as well there is something some concerns of Pakistan and I think Taliban need to address them right. this is the right time right. Uh, if, if you if you uh, allow me I just want to ask uh, but uh, with due respect should we be talking to Pakistani Taliban or should we uh, we be actually going for exterminating all of them sir and which which Pakistani Taliban we should be talking whosoever is not killing a Pakistani I think sir please go ahead thank you uh, Farooq uh, my take has always been that uh, we should not talk to any proxy with guns in their hands. And especially the proxy, we have strong evidences, proven evidences, that they have been working as a hostile proxy in the hands of the uh, intelligence agencies of India and Afghanistan and other countries. So when we say we must talk to them, uh, uh, my point of view is that we don't talk to proxies. They talk to states and the uh, state talks to a uh, political Good entity. Point. They don't talk to criminals. They have killed hundreds and thousands of people in Pakistan. They have uh, damaged Pakistan interest uh, beyond my years. And therefore, my take is we have to fight them all and eliminate them. Uh, uh, when we say uh, in the middle of the war that we must talk to them, we are actually diluting our own response and we are demoralizing our uh, troops in the field and the commanders who are daily sacrificing their lives fighting the same entity. How can you talk to them when they are unrelentedly, you know, killing your people and uh, they are uh, executing sabotage, subversion in your country all over? So, uh, so, uh, so, 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 so,
uh, as we know once a spook is always a spook there are nds people uh, within afghanistan who right now could be portraying as part of taliban right now but if we look at the bla and blf right now the uh, the, the uh, arms we are seeing in their hands it seems as if they are very high fi arms and the same the similar arms they used to be with the uh, with the afghan national army in past as well could we say that them spooks are still used by raw uh, the nds spooks uh, against pakistan and they are the ones who are sending all of these arms to bla sir and brigadier sir last question with reference to eliminating does that mean an all out military action and where does it end where would that, that logically conclude until you win sir please go ahead how fight what's the oh. measure of victory last man Bring left up. all right uh, uh, the panel of three is actually shooting all questions with me so i am feeling very honored really that's the debate um, sir because i seem to have all the answers uh, but let me give you my personal view point uh, the example of uh, sri lanka uh, is uh, uh, one to quote uh, tamil tigers fought the sri lankan government and ultimately got defeated they were getting support from india um, the same is the case now with gdp and uh, bla and uh, of the uh, they ilk uh, when we somebody tells me that we ought to talk to them uh, i don't believe that you talk to these entities which are uh, minuscule when compared to the might of pakistan military might and the experience that we have had if we in the last 20 years have fought dozens of proxies simultaneously fighting us in balochistan and especially in kpk the former tribal area when when we have been able to defeat them by kinetics and of course simultaneously undertaking the development works in the former tribal areas which are now part and parcel of kpk so that should give us a reassurance that these small pygmies who are called tt uh, the, uh, the, uh, the pakistan taliban and uh, uh, the bla kind of thing we know their sponsors we know their handlers uh the, the only thing we got to show patience that now since they have shifted and it, it's not only afghanistan soil they are using they are also let's not shy away from saying that they are openly using the iran soil also so we have to talk to the governments in these two countries and right. uh, we have to tell the international community what is happening in pakistan but uh, that is just a diplomatic part of it but uh, factually being a soldier being a veteran of uh, uh, war in tribal areas i can tell you that the terrorists have to be eliminated i must underscore they have to be eliminated they have to be fought but as regards causing a recoil on their handlers and on their sponsors we have to pay them in the same coin when we are fighting the proxies launched by india and in the second breath we say we must initiate peace process with the india we should start trade that actually undermines our stance and our, our resolve or our political stance right. has thank you been, uh, thank you very much brigadier salim unfortunately we're almost out of time so i'll have to cut you short um but with reference to what was earlier being said of course uh, that uh, whenever we talk about terrorists they must be eliminated that's a dangerous statement for me because of course when we see uh, what exactly or who exactly is a terrorist that um is very broad and has been abused and we know okay. um uh, it happens um, in india and other parts of the world and so uh, is that really something that we can say one secondly i also want to uh, know uh, when we talk about elimination and we're talking about military action have you not always said that military solution does not exist and will not uh, move towards peace right are you asking me yes varu right uh, n- number one uh, uh, there has to be a time when we have to decide who are the ttp and bla and blf and all these people right mm. are they proxies are they terrorists or are they our strange brothers okay i think uh, when you talk about india's example how many terrorists uh, uh, or uh, people have actually they found actually killing people in india a mm. uh, few hundred i think Uh, were compared it to 80,000 Pakistanis who are already dead and remember we are talking about five Pakistani soldiers who were assassinated martyred by, uh, from the Afghan soil right uh, that is the contingent point mm. right now but the justification so, is a no no hang on hang on hang on i am not mm. saying that you actually go and you physically kill everybody the okay. point is you subdue everybody mm. right 
if you are a criminal, if you are a murderer, your, uh, your, where should you be? Should you be actually negotiating and then walking free? Hmm. Or should you be behind bar? If you are actually still trying to kill me, there, there is a very simple statement, uh, adage that comes from English, and that is, if your life is my death, better you die, right? Yeah. These people are not innocent and strange people, uh, you know, brothers. You have to start working out who is your enemy and who is your friend. So how exactly and do you subdue the people, them? And uh, the people, you fight to the bitter end. What else do you do? So you don't kill, you but you fight. Actually, I, uh, ten years ago, I was actually, whenever I would come to my office, I used to have this feeling that I can be killed by a random bomb blast, yeah. mm. right? Uh, and I thought that it's okay as long as the country survives. I think, so I think why would I say that we should show mercy to any of these elements? Mm. No, I, I, I think, uh, Farooq, uh, I would agree with you. Yes, we must fight. But before that fight, I think uh, there should be a statement by the government that this is the certain time, like we give you a month to lay the arms. And whoever lays the arms, yeah, and the obviously, loots, no, no, and, no. And the loot sale says how many people you have killed b before. <laughs> That's okay until you actually, uh, you know, benefit uh, benefit from the sale. I think uh, no, no, no. I think a clear <laughs> My statement. Blood is not a that clear deep, statement right? would make the difference. Give them no a time of of a month or so and tell them to lay the arms. Whoever doesn't do it. Yes, of course, there is a war going on against them. There is a country that was mentioned that is called Sri Lanka. And their Tamil Tigers actually almost destroyed the country. Mm. But the country did not stop till the time, the, the, you know, uh, Tamil Tigers did not declare and surrender mm. and end up all the, enti the entire, you know, uh, um, uh, project. So I think that at this moment when you're talking about fighting with terrorists, if you are thinking that they are proxies, you should be getting a bit of things. All right, let's also include um, in our show our guest for our next segment, which is in <coughs> reference to uh, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin getting closer, uh, and of course with regards to the Ukrainian crisis. For this, we've been joined by Michael Kugelman, who's the Deputy Director, Asia Program at the Wilson Center USA. Thank you very much, Michael, for being with us today. And we've also been joined by Andrei Kortanov, who's the Director General of the Russian International Affairs Council. Thank you very much, Andrei, for being with us in the debate today. Um, with reference to what, of course, has come out uh, uh, between uh, after the meeting between uh, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin, are of course uh, closer ties between uh, both the countries um, and uh, a statement also uh, moving towards uh, NATO and security assurances that Russia has been calling for in the past as well, um, and uh, the calling out on NATO for not expanding eastward, and, and of course with reference to other security assurances that has been asking for as well. Um, uh, Mr. Andre, when we see that. Um, Russia and China, of course, uh, share their mistrust um, of the West, of the uh, US and EU. Uh, we can understand uh, what brings the two countries closer. Uh, but as a diplomatic way of dealing with what's going on or the way that inter international politics are actually uh, evolving in reference to the uh, Ukrainian crisis, um, do you think that this is a wise strategy moving forward and is not um, or could not potentially uh, have negative impacts for all the players? Well, I think that we should look uh, into what uh, they have decided in Beijing. Uh, definitely, the Chinese side uh, supported uh, the Russian position uh, towards NATO. I think uh, China has nothing to lose uh, by supporting uh, Mr. Putin on this issue. However, uh, China doesn't want to take sides in the Russian-Ukrainian dispute, and it is also very clear that uh, China did not uh, recognize uh, the new status of Crimea. Uh, it is uh, a major investor in Ukraine, I, and uh, therefore I would like to focus primarily, primarily on Russia-Western uh, relations. In exchange, uh, Putin stated once again that uh, Russia fully supports uh, the concept of uh, one China uh, and uh, would not uh, really support any move or, of Taiwan towards independence. So I think it's a more or less uh, equal, uh, uh, fair deal for the two sides. Uh, we cannot probably expect more at this juncture. I don't think that uh, any of the sides uh, has lost uh, significantly by doing that. But uh, I think we can observe that China and Russia are gradually moving to an even closer alliance, or at least strategic partnership uh, opposed to primarily 
to the United States, uh, but also to the West at large. Yeah, Michael, I wanted to ask you, as uh, you know, uh, uh, Kotonov, uh, Mr. Kotonov just mentioned that closer alliance between both of the uh, uh, regional powers. Uh, I just wanted to know, would it affect East China Sea as well? Would it affect uh, two very good allies of America, South Korea and Japan, the way things are moving there? Would it affect that as well, sir? Well, yeah, certainly, um, or possibly. Um, I think that for the U.S., um, you know, this was a uh, this meeting was between the two leaders was expected, and the U.S. certainly acknowledges that this is a very uh, rapidly growing relationship between China and Russia, and it's going to be of concern uh, to Washington just because I think that you know the U.S. essentially uh, its foreign policy is viewed through two dominant lenses these days, and one is competition with China, and one is competition with Russia. And there's really no way around that. And so to see the two leaders of the two countries having this major summit in Beijing in which they came out with a joint statement that laid out all types of different areas of cooperation, that certainly will be concerning um, to the U.S. But you know, to the issue of the uh, your question, the South China Sea, uh, this has always been a concern um, of the U.S. And I think that uh, perhaps the biggest flashpoint um, for U.S.-China competition as perceived by, by Washington uh, because of indeed the Taiwan factor, but also the fact that, as I think you had suggested, you know, the U.S. has key treaty allies in that area, whether you're talking about Japan or South Korea or whatever the case may be. So any uh, concern that Russia would be aligning its views toward that issue with China would certainly be uh, of concern um, to the United States as well, just because it would see that as an even bigger uh, challenge to um, to overcome. But, you know, I see this from a, from a perspective in Washington, I think that the big takeaway from this summit uh, is that these two leaders were reasserting their their solidarity uh, in the sense that they both feel that the West is opposed to them, is ganging up on them, poses uh, challenges to them. And this is an opportunity for them to engage together and to engage in a show of defiance against the United States um, and the West at a moment when uh, Russian relations with the U.S. And, and Chinese relations with the U.S., of course, are, are really um, at one of the lowest points possible. Hmm. Uh, Mr. Andre, does this also not uh, impact uh, the way that we can see um, the crisis in Ukraine evolving uh, with uh, Russia um, and the U.S. moving towards um, a way to uh, formulate a peaceful negotiation or actually uh, uh, consider the proposals that, of course, have been put forward as well? Um, uh, we thought, of course, that this is something that Vladimir Putin uh, discussed in the past as well. Um, and eventually the goal is, of course, to resolve the conflict there. But uh, doesn't this actually uh, put the situation in a question mark? Well, uh, there are rumors, of course, uh, that uh, this crisis uh, is uh, uh, an advantage uh, for China because uh, it distracts uh, the attention of the West uh, from China and focuses their attention on Russia. Uh, on the other hand, uh, we do remember that uh, sometimes uh, a major international crisis uh, occurred uh, during Olympic Games. Uh, that was the case uh, back in uh, uh, 2008 when we had uh, a war in the South Caucasus and it coincided with the Olympic Games in Beijing. Uh, later on, uh, the uh, uh, developments uh, in uh, Ukraine coincided with the Sochi Olympics uh, uh, in uh, 2014. Uh, so, of course, uh, there are concerns that uh, probably uh, something might happen and uh, something uh, really bad uh, might happen during the games. I hope uh, that uh, it's wrong. I hope that there'll be no war. But even if no one wants a war in Ukraine, it can still happen. It can still happen uh, as, uh, as an uh, inadvertent escalation, a human error, technical miscalculation with so many troops uh, 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 along the border. Anything can happen. Mm. Right. Uh, Dr. Akartanov, uh, I'm glad that we are talking about the potential of cooperation between these two countries and what might be the implications. Let me ask you, while at this moment there is e it is easy to see them as natural allies, uh, both uh, seem to have very different worldview. For example, uh, we cannot confuse BRI with the Eurasia, uh, Eurasian bloc. So do you think that at some point there is going to be some co conflict of interest because both actually believe in a, a different center of power, sir? 
Well, my take is that uh, uh, until uh, the two current leaders are in power, uh, namely President Putin and Chairman Xi, uh, it's very unlikely that uh, there'll be a rift between Russia and China because the two leaders invested so much in this relationship. Uh, for them, uh, it is clearly a strategic investment. And also, you know, with all the differences, with all the disagreements that they might have, with all the wrinkles in this relationship, uh, there are many very powerful factors that uh, bring them close to each other. Uh, look, for example, at the economic relations. Last year, uh, there was a very significant increase uh, in the bilateral trade. And uh, uh, when Putin came to Beijing, uh, they discussed uh, how they can reach uh, the level of $200 billion of annual trade uh, within three or four years from now. So there are opportunities for uh, for the relationship. And uh, I don't think that uh, the two leaders will allow this uh, relationship to go down the drain, at least uh, not not in the immediate future, not uh, even in the midterm future. Yeah, Michael, uh, we have a very, uh, you know, uh, strange situation growing up uh, uh, within the uh, you know europe right now and we know that the bilateral relations uh, between china and russia when it comes to economy uh, they used to be around i think last year it was 117.5 billion dollars of uh, you know bilateral trade they had and now they are thinking about improving it to taking it to 200 billion dollars and along with that of course we have seen one of the contracts which is of a 30 year uh, gas pipeline a deal they are going to have and but at the same time we know that in past of course Europe is one of the uh, biggest buyers of uh, gas uh, gas from uh, uh, Russia and of course that was always a point of concern for Russia in past as well and they have been you know sitting on the table talking about their concerns because they had economic uh, concerns as well now, don't you think that they are in a very safe position with all of these lucrative, uh, you know, uh, bilateral uh, trade deals with China and uh, they would be in a very better position to talk? Right. And before uh, you answer that, uh, Michael, uh, uh, I have a question for you, but I'm going to ask you later. But very quickly, one compliment is killing me. Uh, clean shave is really suiting you right now. <laughs> Looking very handsome. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> Well, thank you for that. Uh, that's a great comment. Much appreciation. Um, no, I think that the point that was raised about trade is is critical uh, in terms of how the Euro how you, the Europeans look at their relationship with China and Russia. I mean, we know that the U.S. has struggled to build this bigger, broader global coalition to counter China and to counter Russia, just because for many of the European countries. They do have very significant energy interests and trade interests with both of the countries that they would not want to jeopardize by signing on to U.S. sanctions efforts or other efforts meant to uh, push back against China or Russia. And certainly in the context of the Ukraine crisis, I think that the U.S. has really struggled to get solidarity within the EU countries or consensus within the EU countries about how to approach Russia in this context. Uh, some of the EU, EU countries are not comfortable with the type of har really harsh sanctions that the U.S. would like to uh, uh, put out there, even conceivably before uh, a potential Russian invasion. So I think this is one of the challenges for the Biden administration, not just figuring out its own policy uh, toward Moscow at this very critical juncture, but how to try to get a, uh, more European countries to come into this this tent that at this point at least is not as big as the U.S. would like it to be in terms of these coal, uh, coalition of countries to uh, to um, to deal with this Russia obstacle and it applies to uh, to China as well. So it shows that uh, you know superpowers don't always have it easy when it comes to building coalitions and consensuses when mm -hmm. it comes time to countering other uh, key players. Right. Uh, very quickly, uh, since you were talking about superpowers and uh, their interactions as well. I've, uh, I had a question because uh, like you have been following the Western discourse and Russian and Chinese discourse as well. It seems that everybody is trying to use old models or language uh, to actually define what is happening right now. For example, engagement, containment, uh, uh, then you talk about uh, the tant, the tant, and finally now we are talking about world order, this kind of world order. Don't you think at this moment things keep on changing so quickly 
that it is very difficult to actually, actually use old paradigms or old structures to define what is happening right now and actually forge ahead with something new. All right, good point. Absolutely. No, I think you're you're completely on the mark there, Farouk. And I, I think I've discussed on this uh, channel before that I don't like this this description of what's going on now as a new Cold War. I think that things are actually very different now than they were during the Cold War period. You don't have countries en masse lining up either on the Chinese side or the U.S. side or the Russian side or whatever the case may be. So many players, particularly in Asia, so many countries want to they want to engage with the Chinese, particularly in terms of economic uh, cooperation, but many want to engage with the U.S., uh, including uh, traditional U.S. treaty allies, want to continue to be close with the U.S. on security issues. So it's very complex. Um, but I think that, yes, we talk about all these, these old terms that may not fit for the current uh, situation because it's so complex. But unfortunately, the one old term that I wish were discussed more but can't be because there's not enough of it in existence is multilateralism. That is what has really been lacking. And I think that is something that I would like to uh, see more of. I talked before about how the U.S. has struggled to build together a broader group of countries to work with it. You know, multilateral institutions are not what they used to be. And I think that is something that is particularly important when you're dealing with a, a world where you have a sole superpower and perhaps a second one well on the way with China. But that's what's missing. And that's what we need more of in a world that is so, in a world order that is so uh, uncertain and certainly very unstable. I wish there were more multilateralism at this point. Right. Mr. Andre, another part of that uh, joint statement that was released after the summit um, was um, a shared understanding of what democracy is. Um, how much of this actually does exist? Um, what sort of uh, ways uh, do, uh, does Russia and China actually share their versions of democracy? Uh, what really is it that uh, they both agree on if there are multiple factors? Um, and then, of course, what sort of an impact will this ideological uh, convergence actually have in the way uh, that the alliance is going to be looked at and then uh, actually uh, for play out in terms of uh, its politics with other countries such as the U.S.? Well, first of all, uh, it should be noted that uh, Russia and China have uh, two very different uh, political systems. Uh, there might be a degree of convergence between the two nations, but still, you know, China is uh, essentially a communist country, uh, so it uh, could be compared to the former Soviet Union, but uh, not to the contemporary Russia. Uh, Russia claims uh, to be a democracy and uh, a capitalist country, Again, uh, you can see a very significant role of state in the Russian economy, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it is uh, different uh, from China and does not, does not have a communist party to run the place. However, I think what unites uh, uh, the Kremlin uh, and Beijing is uh, the uh, perception that uh, uh, the world uh, should uh, provide uh, for uh, political pluralism that uh, mm. she had, there should be various uh, de developmental uh, models in the world, uh, different political systems, and that uh, no state uh, can claim modernity uh, as its monopoly. And of course, uh, the uh, perception is that uh, liberal democracy might have depleted uh, its creative potential, uh, and therefore uh, new experiments uh, in uh, China or in Russia uh, should uh, be justified uh, as attempts uh, to find uh, new forms of social and political organization. Uh, of course, it's uh, self-serving in many ways, but I think uh, this is one of the issues on which uh, uh, Russia and China uh, definitely uh, 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 coincide in the uh, views on the world and uh, the common world order. Uh, the perception is that uh, liberal democracy is no longer the only game in town. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Kartano, uh, I'm glad that you brought up uh, the difference in two political systems. You're right that China is essentially a socialist country, but power still is uh, really diffuse even at the top. There seems to be, you know, various bodies that share uh, the uh, jointly exercised power. In Russia, it seems that it is all concentrated in one person. Is it not so? So if any alliance is made today, what will be its longevity depending on that person's stay in power, sir? Well, I think that uh, definitely uh, the political decision-making process in Russia is uh, uh, centralized. Uh, 
But, you know, I have to tell you that, of course, uh, China is moving in the same direction. Uh, and uh, Chairman Xi is changing the system that uh, existed in the country for at least uh, 30 years. And we will see what will happen at the 20th uh, 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 Congress of the Chinese Communist Party. But it seems that uh, China is gradually moving to more personalized power. Uh, from this viewpoint, it is becoming more similar to Russia than it was earlier. Uh, definitely, uh, that creates uh, certain opportunities for the two countries. Uh, they can mobilize resources, they can make fast decisions, uh, they can uh, ignore political opposition, but that creates also significant risks when too much depends on a single person. Uh, definitely, institutions suffer. And uh, any state is, is as strong as uh, its institutions are, in the end of the day, at least. Yeah. Michael, uh, would there be any message for a country like India that is widely being considered as a frontline of U.S. in the region? Uh, of course, in the context when we know that uh, Russia uh, sells arms to India as well. So with this alliance and with this meetup, would there, would there be a message going to India as well, sir? Yes, uh, I mean, I think so. Uh, India is in a very difficult spot, uh, when obviously, when it comes to this Russia-Ukraine uh, crisis. And certainly, the Russia-China Russia relationship poses a strategic challenge for India, of course, given its, its, its rivalry with China and its friendship with Russia. Uh, you know, in the past, India has, has, has um, thrived or claimed to thrive on this idea of balancing its relations with different countries, including different major powers, uh, such as now. But, uh, yeah, I think that um, India is in a very tough spot uh, right now. And I think that, you know, you're not going to hear much public comments from uh, Indian officials throughout this crisis. Um, I think that India quietly recognizes that it would its interests would be um, uh, not jeopardized, but uh, hurt in a big way by a Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine and a Russian war. Uh, for a variety of reasons. But, um, you know, I think India is just going to be keeping very quiet. I doubt it was surprised at all that this Russia-China summit happened. And uh, it's going to uh, hope that in due course, uh, cooler minds will prevail and that there will not be a crisis. And let's, let's be very clear, no one benefits from a war, uh, including Russia. So I think that everyone in India and others are hoping that eventually, despite this huge mobilization of Russian forces, that things will uh, eventually calm down. Right. Thank you so right. much, Michael Thank Kugelman and Andre Kortanov mm. for joining us um, in the show today and, of course, taking the time out. Uh, One liner. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding India's just strategy, it reminded me once again of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy <laughs> of one character or oh, one creature co called uh, Bug Blatter Beast of Troll, um, um, uh, a creature so silly that it thinks mm -hmm. that if it cannot see you, you, yeah. can see, uh, you cannot see it. Right. right. So India That's might be exactly. thinking that people can't see what it is doing, mm -hmm. but shutting the eyes will not do. You put a big smile on Faisal's face, um, and he's so happy to have also brought up this in the show as usual. Finally. Um, but of course, uh, we'll keep discussing different issues in the debate. That's what the show is all about. And I hope uh, that all of you who watched our show today learned a bit something more, uh, of course, from our panelists and um, their respected analysts in the studio as well. We'll join you once again tomorrow at 9 p.m. Stay tuned. Thank you.